So with uh, Richard Rorty, you have a philosopher who's emphasizing that you can't be irresponsible uh, to a, a group of which you're not a member. Right? That responsibility and rationality also are always dependent upon the group uh, 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 in which you are embedded, the vocabulary that you're speaking with, the community of which you're a member. Now, he puts this in the context of the history of philosophy in the little essay I gave you to read, in, uh, insofar as he talks about the debate between Kantians who are looking for intrinsic human dignity, they're looking for human rights, they're looking for uh, a historical distinction between morality and prudence. These are the the things we've already talked about, um, as opposed to the Hegelians who are really just looking at human dignity as, um, as uh, something that comes out of being part of a community, uh, that's something that comes out of participation without appeal to impartial criteria. So Rorty says, if the Hegelians are right, there are no ahistorical criteria to which we can appeal to justify our moral decisions. So this is Hegel without foundations, because uh, Hegel sometimes thought, uh, or at least it appears he thought, that there was a grounding to history and that history just revealed this grounding or this foundation. But for Rorty, what Hegel's great insight uh, was, was that history is it all. History reveals truth with a capital T. And for Rorty, the, 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 the distinction is that um, history goes on forever. This is really like Dewey says, uh, 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 that inquiry is, uh, Inquiry is endless. We just keep asking questions. We say something's true when we want to pay some part of our inquiry a compliment or we get lazy, we don't want to do any more inquiry. We say, okay, that's true. But someone else is going to pick up the question. Someone else is going to continue that history. And for Rorty, that's the difference between the Hegelian and the Kantian. It's, for the Hegelian, it's always about somebody else being part of the community, somebody else picking up the historical threads. But there is no impartial criteria according to which you can judge that um, activity, that, that, that historical change. And so Rorty here talks about post-philosophy, that is giving up this notion that philosophy can be a referee, tell you uh, what kind of work you're doing. Are you doing rational work or irrational? Are you doing science? Or are you doing humanities? Are you doing the noumenal or the phenomenal? Rorty says, away with all that. And he made that argument in a great book uh, of uh, history of philosophy called The Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, in which he argued that philosophy was constantly trying to say which of the things we do, which of the things we say are closer to the real. And he, and he tried to show, I think he did show, that that notion of getting closer to the real is uh, fundamentally flawed. Um, and that what we have are more or less useful ways of coping with the world more or less adaptive strategies of, uh, of uh, dealing with the world. And what matters uh, 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 is how, our, how we feel we are being served by the tools we have, not whether those tools uh, match some ultimate uh, reality. Um, and in terms of morality, that means that our morality is based on what Will, uh, uh, Willard Sellers called um, uh, we intentions. That is, uh, uh, morality is based on um, the groups to which we think our ideas are relevant, the groups to which, which we think we have some connection with. And um, morality is not, a, here's the fundamental part, morality is not universal. That's the departure from Kant, right? Kant said you can t tell if something is moral by understanding whether the maxim behind the action is in principle universalizable. Rorty, on the other hand, uh, as like Seller says, morality is, a, is, is grounded or is uh, <laughs> grounded in community, which means it has no foundation. It is morality is a product of our participation in uh, a community over time. Um, and um, uh, that leaves philosophy out of the game of finding foundations or finding the really real, the terms we've used in this class. There is no really real. Um, uh, and in that sense, Rorty is in the tradition of Nietzsche. He's in the tradition of critical theory. But uh, he also thinks that the communities to which we pay allegiance now are ones we should try strive to improve rather than to demolish because they have no foundations. The less certainty we have, the better, I think. And, you know, 
it would be best if all the general principles that we use to guide our actions were left open for discussion. Certainty is not a goal of intellectual life, or it shouldn't be. So, but do you need to reach a, a certainty, you know, certain point, like in order to act on something, you have to come to a determination? You also, you have to have the courage to act without certainty. Typically, we don't have certainty. So, what do we have? We have just probability, likelihood? We make our practical decisions on the basis of experience, the people we've run into, the books we've read, everything in our past lives, we don't make them typically on the basis of principle, nor should we. Rorty had an enormous impact on contemporary philosophy. Uh, he stirred up a lot of controversy because uh, uh, he was so rigorously against the idea of foundationalism. And he came from a background in analytic philosophy and he was able to, to show um, why foundationalism didn't make sense from within analytic philosophy. At least um, uh, he, he, he tried to show that and, and analytic philosophers uh, um, uh, continue to respond to that challenge. He helped reinvigorate pragmatism as a, uh, a school of thought uh, that emphasizes inquiry um, and practice rather than foundations or ahistorical criteria. Um, the next thinker we're going to talk about uh, today is Cornell West, who is, uh, 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 was a friend and, and, uh, and studied with uh, Richard Rorty, friend of uh, Richard Rorty's and studied with him. Um, we, I remember being in a seminar with uh, Cornell West uh, on Heidegger that, that Rorty gave uh, uh, at Princeton, and uh, uh, Cornell West wrote a really important book about uh, uh, pragmatism and uh, a prophecy or the romantic prophetic tradition, um, and uh, has gone on to do much political and philosophical work. What, what I want us to pay attention to in Cornell West's work is his attempt to go beyond the ironic deflationary parts of Richard Rorty's uh, uh, contribution and use his, West's attempt to use pragmatism to invigorate uh, a, uh, a political, uh, a radical political uh, critique of contemporary American society. Um, for him, for West, pragmatism, he says, um, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, poised between a sense of tragedy and a sense of revolution. Uh, uh, West says, the relation of tragedy to revolution is intertwined with that of tradition and progress. A prophetic pragmatism, this is West's term for his uh, kind of philosophy, prophetic pragmatism as a form of third wave left romanticism tempers its utopian impulse with a profound sense of the tragic character of life and history. The romanticism thoroughly saturated the discourse of modern thinkers. Can you totalize? Can you make things whole? Can you create harmony? If you can't, disappointment. Disappointment is always at the center. Failure is always at the center. Well, where does romanticism come from? Why begin with romanticism? See, I don't begin with romanticism. No, you remember what Beethoven said on his deathbed, you know? He said, I've learned to look at the world in all of its darkness and evil and still love it. And that's not romantic Beethoven. This is the Beethoven of the string quartets of 131, the greatest, the greatest string quartet ever written, not just in classical music, but of course it's European forms. Beethoven is the grand master. But uh, string quartet, you go back to those movements, there's no, no romantic wholeness to be shattered as in early Beethoven. He's given up on that, you see. This is where Chekhov begins. This is where the blues starts. This is where jazz starts. You think Charlie Parker's upset because he can't sustain a harmony? He didn't care about the harmony. He's trying to completely ride on the dissonance, ride on the blue notes. Of course, he's got harmony in terms of its interventions here and there. But why start with this obsession with wholeness? And if you can't have it, then you're disappointed and want to have a drink and melancholia and blah, 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 blah. No, you see, the blues, my kind of blues, begins with catastrophe, begins with the angel of history and, 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 and Benjamin's thesis, you see. It begins with the power of the wreckage. On one power on another. That's the starting point. The blues is personal catastrophe lyrically expressed. And black people in America and in the modern world, given these vicious legacies of white supremacy, it is how to, do you generate an elegance of earned self-togetherness 
so that you have a stick to itness in the face of the catastrophic and the calamitous and the horrendous and the scandalous and the monstrous. See, part of the problem, though, is that see, when you have a romantic project, you're so obsessed with time as loss and time as a taker. Whereas as a Jacobian Christian, I want to stress as well time as a gift and time as a giver. So that, yes, it's failure, but, you know, how good is a failure? You've done some wonderful things. Now, Becca could say, you know, try again, fail again, fail better. But why call it failure? I mean, why not say you have a sense of gratitude that you're able to do as much that as you did? You're able to love as much and think as much and play as much. Why think you needed the whole thing? You see what I mean? This is even disturbing about America. And, of course, America is a romantic project. It's Paradiso, City on the Hill, and all this other mess and lies and so on. I said, no, no, America is a very fragile democratic experiment predicated on the dispossession of the lands of indigenous peoples and the enslavement of, of African peoples and the subjugation of women, the marginalization of, of gays and lesbians. And it has great potential, but this notion that somehow, you know, we had it all or ever will have it all, it's got to go. you got to push it to the side. And once you push all that to the side, then it tends to evacuate the language of disappointment and the language of failure. And you say, okay, well, how much have we done? How have we been able to do it? Can we do more? Well, in certain situations, you can't do more. It's like trying to break dance at 75. You can't do it anymore. You are master at 16. It's over. You can't make love at 80 the way you did at 20. So what? <laughs> Time is real. This is very different from Rorty's register. I mean, he's talking about profound uh, sense and utopian impulse. Rorty's, you know, much more um, uh, temperate, uh, right? He's much uh, less um, uh, uh, dramatic. West uh, loves the drama, and he, and he sees that uh, it's not just drama for him, it is urgency, the pr pragmatic urgency to change the world. But he wants to uh, uh, temper that, even West, tempers that ur sense of urgency with a sense of tragedy, knowing that you can't always um, uh, make the world conform uh, a even to your uh, best impulses. In the reading that uh, I've asked you to find for this week, um, uh, West says that prophetic pragmatism uh, denies Sisyphean pessimism and, u and utopian perfectionism. That is, West is trying to steer a course between pessimism and perfectionism. He wants to tap into Christian traditions as well as pragmatic traditions that he says keep hope alive as a vehicle for energizing the will to change the world, not because we have the foundations, but because we have aspirations um, to make the world uh, a better place through uh, envisioning uh, radical change. What, what West does say is that, you, uh, and here he's firmly in this uh, pragmatic and Rorty tradition, is that you have to move away from epistemology. Epistemology is not uh, important to philosophy, but it is uh, the, the move away from epistemology, he says, or the swerve away from epistemology is a reconception of philosophy as cultural criticism. Philosophy is, becomes a form of cultural criticism that um, uh, West wants to link to democratic aspirations. West also, um, is, is, uh, it's important for him to say the denial of foundations is not a denial of religion. That is, for West, um, belonging to a community of faith can be an empowering uh, act, even without a commitment uh, to foundationalism. Uh, I, that's a hard one um, to, uh, to articulate clearly for me, because I think the uh, West is trying to say, as, as Rorty did, that uh, it's all about the communities uh, to which you belong. And, and West says that the community to which I belong, I, Cornell West, belong, is a, is a Christian community uh, that has a radical utopian impulse. And uh, that's not necessarily a foundation uh, uh, in the philosophic sense, but it is a grounding existential commitment for West um, that, as he says, doesn't just keep uh, hope alive, but it actually keeps one sane in a world of uh, enormous uh, disappointment. And I'll, I'll give you back this, uh, to uh, send you back to a clip now to, to hear West uh, talk a little bit about that. 
uh, um, in, in a section of a do documentary. Yeah, I'll put it this way, that for me, I mean, philosophy fundamentally about uh, our finite situation. I uh, can define that in terms of we're beings toward death, featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces whose body will one day be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. That's us. We're beings toward death. At the same time, we have desire. Why we are organisms in space and time, and so it's desire in the face of death. And then, of course, you've got dogmatism, various attempts to hold on to certainty, various forms of idolatry. And you've got dialogue in the face of dogmatism. And then, of course, structurally and institutionally, you have domination. And you have democracy. You have attempts of people trying to render accountable elites, kings, queens, suzerains, corporate elites, politicians, trying to make these elites accountable to everyday people. So philosophy itself becomes a critical disposition of wrestling with desire in the face of death, wrestling with dialogue in the face of dogmatism, and wrestling with democracy, trying to keep alive very fragile democratic experiments in the face of structures of domination, patriarchy, white supremacy, imperial power, um, uh, state power, all those concentrated forms of power that are not accountable to people who are affected by it. So one question that keeps coming up, or a, a, you know, a phrase, is this idea of the meaningful life. Do you think it is philosophy's duty to speak on this? A meaningful life? How to live a meaningful life. Is that even a relevant, is that even a, an appropriate question for a philosophy? No, I think it is. Uh, no, I think the problem with meaning is very important. Nihilism is a serious challenge. Uh, meaninglessness is a serious challenge. Even making sense of meaninglessness is itself a kind of discipline and achievement. But the problem is, of course, you never reach it. You know, it's not a static stationary telos or end or aim. It's a, it's a process that one never reaches. It's Sisyphean. You know, you're going up the hill looking for uh, better meanings or grander, more ennobling, enabling meanings. But you never reach it, uh, you know, in, in that sense, you die without being able to have the whole in the language of romantic discourse. <laughs>